<laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, to the Fireside Chat, 49th Fireside Chat, that is. We're going to start by getting caught up on some of the questions that we have not had a chance to get uh, to get asked yet. So, Tom, we're going to start with Trinity Travels. He's asking, is it possible to contact other reality frames using a radio? I've seen a documentary called The Skull Experiment, and they contacted deceased people, and also there's a movie called White Noise, which supports this theory. Uh, what is your thought on that? Well, it's not so much that you're using a radio to contact dead people as it is dead people are using a radio to contact you. Um, the way that works is that any system that has a lot of uncertainty in it, okay, it's more easily manipulated by yourself or by, you know, the larger consciousness system. So if the system is trying to uh, make a point or trying to uh, get some people to see that reality is bigger than they thought, if the system is making a wake-up call to the people who are participating and maybe the people who see it, then it can do that. That is that is one of the, the venues that it can use. Or not venue in the right word. That's one of the, the modes that it can use in order to do something that helps wake people up. So if you have, say, a radio tuned between stations, you will get white noise, static, and that is entirely random, and that can be more easily modified. That randomness can be modified by the system to make um, sounds, you know, to make uh, some sort of, uh, I guess, speech that you could understand, just like a TV tuned between stations so that there's no program on you get uh, a lot of what's called snow on your screen. Well, it's not, obviously it's not snow on your screen. It's just random signals. It's noise. So that, if you look at that, it's not that hard for a picture to show. Now the picture isn't going to start running like a movie. You're just going to get a flash of an image, uh, something that will last just for a few seconds. Just um, not, uh, not, it's not like, uh, you know, the bad guy takes over all the uh, communication equipment in the world and everybody gets to listen to the bad guy tell you what he's going to do. You know, it's not that kind of a thing where you have a program superimposed over what you had. It's that you've got noise and that noise will flicker on and off to give you little bits and pieces of information that sound like uh, words being spoken or pictures being given. So that sort of a thing is... Um, you know, is possible, and it happens a lot, and it, it'll sometimes happen even if there isn't noise. The noise just makes it more probable. It's just easier to do with the noise, but I have heard people talk about getting a phone call from their deceased mother uh, like two weeks after she died, and the phone rings, and they pick it up, and it's mom on the phone. And mom usually says something like, well, I just wanted you to know that I'm just fine and everything's doing good and, and you don't have to worry about me, that sort of a thing. And the system does that not because the message is so important to the deceased person, but it's something to help the, the griever, the person who's still here, deal with their loss. So the system does that in order to help that person let go of their self pity and their grief and get kind of back into the back into the game and also to open up open up people's eyes let them know that reality is bigger than they thought so yes those things are possible and uh, people tend to use the the noise as a media like white noise as a media because that uh, white noise makes an easier process for the system to use because there's all that randomness there but again it doesn't make a movie for you it just gives you glimpses little pieces of things so if you set that up with the idea that you're going to let the larger world communicate with you then you set up that situation and if the lcs has something to say to you that would be a mode that it could use so yes possible but it's also possible you could stare at your tv snow and never see anything, you know, other than uh, uh, 
uh, fleeting bits of things that trigger your imagination because of the patterns. So it has a lot to do with the intent of the practitioner to use this for that for that purpose. All right, Tom, thank you. One more question from Trinity was, Tom, do you ever visit high entropy reality frames to rescue IUOCs, that's individuated units of consciousness, that's us, that are stuck in these places? Uh, no, I have done that a long, long time ago. But uh, actually, IUOCs don't get stuck uh, as much as as uh, people would uh, help you believe. Mostly IUOCs know what they're doing. They're making choices. They have choices um, all the time. There's no place where they have no choices. And they are where they are because of the choices they've made. And things will happen or not happen because of additional choices they make. So it's not true that there are a lot of IUOCs out there just needing to be rescued, that they're in difficult places. Now, Rescue the IUOC in Trouble is the name of another virtual reality game that you can play. And if you get into that reality, if you sign on or log on to that virtual reality, then there will be lots and lots of IUOCs that need to be rescued. But that's just another virtual reality game. It's like switching between, uh, you know, The Sims and World of Warcraft and uh, maybe some other uh, virtual reality. It's, uh, it's just another reality that has another theme, and that theme is rescue poor IUOCs that are stuck. So that's a, that's a virtual reality you can play in, but it's generally not a part of the natural world. Natural world doesn't uh, work like that. IUOCs don't get into places that are that they're stuck very long. The sticking is all of their own choice, and in those cases where transitions are difficult, there's only few of those, and that's where the individual um, is so what's the word so wound up in a particular idea, a particular thing going on that they have trouble letting go of it. In that case, there's a little bit of a problem in getting them unstuck, you might say, but that's only a matter of a very short period of time. It's not something where they stay stuck for a long period of time. It's a very uh, minor uh, blip if they are that uh, obsessed with something. It uh, only takes a short while to break through that obsession during the transition. So it's, uh, you're probably talking about the virtual reality games. And there's other, there's multiple virtual reality games that are save, save the IUOCs from being stuck. So there's, there's more than one game of, of that that you could log into. Thank you, Tom. We'll move on to a question from somebody. In July 2018 Fireside Chat, you very eloquently answered, and thank you very much, by the way, the following question I posted, is deifying the LCS also a result of human herd mentality? If so, what then is the proper way to consider our relationship to the LCS? Your response was based mostly on a teacher's perspective of how metaphors are used to intellectually explain and interpret the concepts of a god in order to make that concept accessible to the largest target audience possible. I was hoping now for a more subjective interpretation of how a student can or should approach his or her personal relationship to the LCS. So allow me to ask it in this way. What is your most predominant feeling or feelings in the context of your own personal relationship with the LCS? It is, is it submission, admiration, reverence, love, joy, partnership, gratitude, etc., or is it perhaps all of the above? I'm guessing that your answer will be any of the aforementioned sentiments would be viable ways for a free will awareness unit to perceptively experience the LCS. If so, in which case, I'd add the question, are any of these feelings preferable or superior to others? Okay. Well, it sounds like um, <laughs> you got a lot out of the last answer, and you already know the answer to you know this question. You're right. It's all of the above. Uh, all of them are ways that you can... Uh, uh, interact with the larger conscious system, ways of personally connecting to that system. All the ways you mentioned are valid. I'd say the best, the 
best connection is individual. It's not like there is one best way to have that interface, that personal connection with the LCS. It depends on the person. The connection that is least likely to trigger your ego, to trigger your sense of uh, being special um, in, a, in a way that uh, sets you above others, that would be a better way for you. So, you, we, you know, we have these three different paths, general, real general paths that uh, we, we uh, describe. And people move along one of these three or along some combination of them. And one of them is the uh, warrior's path, which really is the path of knowledge. Okay, and that's where you try to figure it out as you go and understand it and practice and so on. So you struggle your way through the learning process. The other is the path of, path of service, where it's about others. And by making your life about others, by providing services, and not services that, that, uh, pu that puff up your ego, but services, services just because you want to help, okay, giving yourself to others. That's the second path. And the third path path is the path of surrender, where you just give yourself up to the LCS and um, try to understand what you can best do to serve it in the sense that you no longer um, are being run by your capital I. It's not about you. It's not the, it's not the me. It's you surrender to this larger thing. All right, so we can see those three paths. You know, one of them is is, uh, is kindness, things that you do. Um, the uh, warrior's path has to do with your 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 learning. That's an intellectual path, and the, the one that you're you're kind of pointing at here is the one of surrender, where you just surrender yourself to the larger consciousness system, and that would be the traditional religious path. So any of those paths will take you to the same place. But some people are more suited to one than the other. If you're a very intellectual person, then the warrior's path is a better path for you. If you're a very uh, uh, giving person, but giving in the sense of doing, of, of doing things, then the path of service is better for you. If it's just a matter of being and letting your being merge with the LCS and just surrendering to it, then you're, you know, that path, the path of being is probably the most direct path, probably the easiest path, but one that is very difficult, particularly for Westerners to do. It's, um, uh, it's more the path of the monk, I suppose, than it is of, uh, most of us living in the, in the Western world. And when I say Western world, that's pretty much the whole world these days, a world that is very uh, uh, materialist based. So any of those ways work. There is no one best way. Uh, I interface with the LCS in all of those ways. I interface with it intellectually, uh, emotionally. Uh, sometimes the interaction is me just surrendering. Sometimes the interaction is me trying to understand and sometimes it's it's uh, uh, a matter of doing. So whatever seems to work best at the time for you, for what it is you're trying to accomplish, that would be the path that you should be on, and that would be the 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 mode by which you should interact with the larger consciousness system. And that won't necessarily be the same uh, all the time. Switch among those modes to what suits you at the time for what it is you're trying to do. Thanks, Tom. Somebody also asked, does a free will awareness unit's relationship with the LCS differ in any way with that of its IUOC? That is to say, after our current experience packet is over, can the overall sentiments we held towards the LCS in this PMR change somehow after experiencing physical death, or are they always a core aspect of our being level consciousness? Yeah, it's the latter. Um, you don't gain wisdom by dying. You gain wisdom by growing up. Uh, the death experience isn't one that um, provides a lot of insight, although it does at the time 
lets you understand that the um, you know, there is this cycle of, of your consciousness through various, through various, uh, um, avatars. But what you bring forward to the next incarnation is just the quality of your consciousness. And actually many people who go through the cycle of, of life, death, and then rebirth in another experience packet, um, they're not really aware of what it is they're doing. You see, when they die, that, that previous life fades like a dream, and it is very much like a dream. And then when they are in the transition, well, they're aware that there's something else they need to do, and then when they're back in another avatar, that's the only thing they've ever been. They, you know, the avatar is the whole of their, of their memory and their existence. So even though they go through this and have been through this cycle many times, as they go through it, they're not really aware for the most part that they're even going through a cycle. Each of these phases just seems to be a thing in itself and it changes to something else. And that awareness isn't uh, often there for particularly beginners and even for the average uh, um, you know, medium level person. That's true. It's only for those who have been around more and more often and have grown up some that um, they're really aware of the process that they're going through. For the most part, that process you go through is not part of your awareness. So it doesn't really help you grow up. You're not really making a lot of decisions with the perspective of the whole process. So if you're not making choices with respect to the whole process, then the process isn't going to help you grow up because of those choices. So it's just what you what you bring to the world in your new understanding of reality, your, your, your new low entropy configuration, that's what you start with each time. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Fun IUOC asks questions about how age affects the development of our quality of consciousness. Uh, it appears to me that in many cases, young children have a lot of the positive quality of consciousness characteristics that adults are working on developing. They are accepting others without prejudice. They live in the here and now. They don't seek to impress others when they are young enough. They deal with whatever life hands them for example, a broken leg or other disability, without blame. And they are willing to try over and over and learn from their mistakes without regretting their failures along the way. Would you agree that young children can often have a higher quality of consciousness than adults? If so, why would this be the case? Is it because their egos have not had as much time to develop, yet due to their needs are still being taken care of by others? Um, well, I wouldn't really say that they have a higher quality of consciousness than others. Um, I would agree that they do exhibit many of the characteristics that you that you mentioned. Uh, they tend to be more holistic. They tend to be uh, more aware, actually, of, of a larger dimension of reality. They're not uh, materialist yet at, uh, before they get to be seven or eight or nine, ten years old. Uh, they are um, uh, more likely to have connections with the larger system. Uh, they may have non-physical friends, or they may have other um, ways that they uh, use their intent to pick up things. They're very intuitive. So all of that is true. But that doesn't really mean that their IUOC is somehow more advanced. Their IUOC has a certain amount of potential. And in that young age, they have not yet kind of gotten to the point where they are, their IUOC is making um, more complex and more challenging choices, let's say. So the IUOC isn't an age. The IUOC doesn't get go from young to old through a lifetime. The IUOC is just the consciousness that's logged in. But the young person provides that IUOC with a limited set of, of uh, choices. And generally, the, the um, harder choices are not there to young people. Their choices tend to be a lot simpler, a lot less complex. They do have parents taking care of them and making most of the hard choices for them. Um, 
So they have a kind of an easier time of it, and they are still haven't been captured by the kind of materialist viewpoint that we have. And when I say that, I don't mean that in a in a in like the philosophical sense, but they haven't been captured by the idea that this is a physical world and that only the physical world is is what what exists. Um, they still have imaginary worlds to them that are just as real as the physical world. So they do act ways that uh, we wish we could act as we get older. They're very straightforward. That is true. They say what they think. Um, they don't have uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of energy invested in being politically correct. <laughs> They're pretty much transparent. What you see is what you get. And all of that is very nice. But that same quality of consciousness, that same IUC, IUOC, as it grows up in its choices, get a lot larger and more varied and more important. And uh, moral choice and ethical choices become um, important to them. Then kind of their true colors come out. So the child, the, the children's time is an easy time where choices are simpler and uh, it gets harder. As it gets harder, that potential gets more challenged and you get to see what the IUC is actually made of. You know, we talk about pets in the same way. People talk about, well, if you have a dog, the dog is nothing but love. If you want to know how to be and grow up, just try to be like a dog, you know, just be that open. You know, the dog will love its master. If the master is rude to it or forgets to feed it or is angry with it or whatever, the dog will slink around for a few minutes, and then he's right back wagging his tail and happy, and loving his master again. So they, we talk about dogs as like they're very advanced souls and very advanced creatures. But if you've hung around a pack of dogs, uh, dogs that uh, interact with other dogs, you see they're very self-centered for the most part. They, um, uh, they are very hierarchical. And they're not always very nice to each other or with, or with each other. But at the same time, they're very loving to their masters and very caring. So it's a similar kind of thing. Many dogs have a very limited um, decision space. And within that decision space, they appear to be very grown in the sense that they forgive quickly and they seem to give easily, which are very grown-up traits. But that doesn't mean that they would continue with that kind of level of behavior if they had to make uh, a, a wider range of choices. So it, it looks good, just like children. Children and animals you know, can, can look very grown in certain aspects, but those aspects are a very narrow piece of life. And it is uh, not the case that they are higher quality of consciousness. They are just uh, less able to express their inner self yet. And as they have that capability, then the ego shows, the beliefs show, and all the other things that uh, make us not fun to be around and hard to get along with start to show as we develop uh, uh, attitudes and fears as we get older. Thanks, Tom. The second part of Fun IUOC's question uh, deals with the question of uh, do people de-evolve de in old age. A good example was a man I had known most of my life. As a middle-aged man, he had many prejudices and was a religious fundamentalist who thought only his group had any answers. However, after his wife died when he was in his 60s, he met a girlfriend who he loved dearly, but who challenged his beliefs. He became much more open-minded, much more mellow. Still had opinions, but he didn't think his opinions were the only right answers. He became more pleasant to be around than he had ever been in the past. Unfortunately, his girlfriend died a decade later. He found another girlfriend, but she did not challenge his views and instead would commiserate with him on the story, sorry state of the world as he saw it and how various types of people were ruining society and the world. At the same time, he became increasingly bothered by severe arthritis. He severely regressed in terms of quality of consciousness, went back to his religious fundamentalism, could never see the positive in anyone, and generally became someone who no one could stand to be around. At the time he died, his girlfriend and I were the only ones he ever interacted with, and even that was only rarely. I saw another example of this 
on the forum, somebody, someone who obviously had a very high quality of consciousness at an earlier point in life became defensive, critical, and generally drove people away from him. My question is this. Why does the LCS allow people to continue living once they've reached the point where their quality of consciousness is obviously de-evolving instead of evolving? It seems like it would be better for the person to die while at the peak of their quality of consciousness instead of continuing to live in a deteriorating physical body that imposes such severe restraints that the person begins to de-evolve rapidly. Okay. Well, the larger conscious system doesn't just butt in and, and, you know, play with its pet people. It's not that kind of a relationship. We have rule set, and our body functions according to that rule set. And that rule set would have our bodies continue on until they, <laughs> until they can't continue anymore. So growing old is just a, a result of the rule set being the way it is. And the system doesn't come in and kind of harvest, you know, um, if you will, IUOCs because they're at their peak. That's not the point. Growing up isn't just, you see, that person, well, let me say it this way. The person you talk about seemed to go through a lot of different phases. They were grumpy and self-centered and very opinionated. And then they opened up and had a bigger viewpoint. Then they went back and got more uh, opinionated again and and uh, got got grumpy and hard to live with. Well, it's not that that IUOC um, suddenly became more enlightened and more um, more grown up, lower entropy, and then got high entropy again. It would seem that way, but basically that that IUOC reflected his environment more than he reflected probably even his his own convictions. So that IOC in an environment that was more open and an environment that was more um, uh, forgiving and caring and not so self-centered became that way. In other words, he kind of mimicked his environment. And when his environment was more closed and and self-centered, then he became that way. So it's not that he grew up, lowered his entropy, and then de-evolved and got um, uh, a lower quality. It's like he had a higher quality than a lower quality. What you're talking about is acting. Okay. People, you know, exist and, and interact at two levels. One's the intellectual level. That's the acting. And the other is the being level. And that's who you are. And I would say at the being level, that person was consistent. Was consistent all the way through all three of those phases from, from grumpy to open, you know, from, from fearful to open to fearful again, that was the same person, the same IUOC and probably at about the same uh, quality of consciousness. But like most people, we don't live our lives as authentic beings. Who we are is often a mystery to most of us. When some, if somebody looks at you and says, well, who, who are you really? What's your authentic self? Who are you at the authentic being level? Most people don't know. They don't know how to answer that question. Because we grow up in societies and cultures, we tend to have images. We have a lot of cultural beliefs about what, you know, how one should be polite, how you interact with other people what's important and what's not. And we take these on and we act in ways that make us more easily get along with other people. So if everybody else is kind of happy and upbeat and uh, not so uh, uh, self-centered and focused, well, we tend to act that way too. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're grown up. And everybody else is sad and full of self-pity and uh, uh, all can only see the dark side of things. Well, we tend to act that way too. That's part of the collective consciousness, particularly people you're close to, like your significant other, have a effect on you. But so does your, you know, your your culture. Uh, your culture could be national, or it could be regional, or it could be even a human culture, or maybe it's just your family's culture. All of these cultures have their, have their aspect of collective consciousness. And as you belong to a, a collective, as you belong to a group, 
and you feel yourself a part of that group, even if it's just a group of two, you and your significant other, well, you tend to take on the characteristics of that group, and the group tends to take on your characteristics. Of course, if it's a large group, you don't change the, the large group much, but the larger group does tend to change you more. So that is what was really going on there. We see a, a, a quality of consciousness that was acting probably worse than it was in the sense that it had lots of fear because it got that fear from its culture. And then when that fear was removed because it had a significant other that was upbeat and positive and open, then it tended to act more that way. But it's all acting. It's all getting along. It's being the way you feel you should be, being the way that seems to it seems to fit in at the time. So it's not a matter of, of quality and then losing quality, you know, gaining quality and losing quality. The whole thing's just a matter of growing up. And I'd say that that individual uh, was probably more grown than it acted at both the beginning and the end and, and probably uh, felt better and was happier at a time when it was with another entity that was helped pulling it up with another entity that was more grown and had a higher quality of consciousness than it did as it became part of that group. So it's not really that we have consciousness evolving and de-evolving. That is possible. Consciousness can evolve and de-evolve, but we have a lot of acting going on. We have a lot of getting along. We have a lot of reflecting the people that we see, and we try to be like them so that we're more acceptable. We tend to get drawn into fears or not drawn into fears based on the people around us. That's why these conspiracy theories running around on the Internet seem to grab so many people because you have a lot of people who are very fearful. And if you're a very fearful person, then you very easily can get wrapped up in a conspiracy theory. If you are not a fearful person, then you don't get wrapped up in conspiracy theories because they're mainly about fear something awful, something terrible, something to be afraid of. So it's not that people evolve and de-evolve so much as people are affected by their environments in the way they act, in what they believe, and in the fears that they carry with them. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to read one question from Robert A.C. Um, have you verified your past lives as you did with other out-of-body experiences at the Monroe Institute, for example, did you check birth and death certificates, newspapers, school records, army records, and things like that? Uh, no, I did not. I never bothered to to, to uh, explore past lives other than just very um, superficially because I just didn't have a lot of interest in that. That just didn't seem to me to be too important to my growth or what I was doing. I had um, a, a very low level, I guess, of curiosity about it in the sense that I didn't see how it mattered too much about where I was and my growth now. The choices I'm making now are important to how I'm growing up now. Uh, what, it, what I have been, I just didn't think was all that meaningful to the choices that I'm making now. So therefore, it wasn't all that meaningful at all. So now I didn't do all that. Uh, I did lots of things that were evidential, but I didn't go down that path of collecting things that were evidential. There's plenty of other things you can do that are evidential besides uh, trying to check out um, past lives. So I'm not uh, one of those people who care a whole lot one way or the other about past lives. The data is available, but it's um, I, I have a hard time finding a lot of value in it. All right, Tom, next question is from Voyager on the reasons for the Psy Uncertainty Principle. Has Tom ever talked about the reasons why he postulated the Psy Uncertainty Principle? What is the evidence that motivated him to think that this is how reality really works? Is it personal experience, like he can do things considered to be paranormal, but when he tries to show them to others, they simply don't work? Or did he did others show him paranormal things which he could experience because... He's in the loop, so to speak. But when they tried to show them to others, they never worked. Or is it more general than that, 
like you read or heard about others who have said they could do things when they when they're by themselves but not when others are watching i've watched nearly all of tom's videos and read parts of his book but i've never heard him talk about why he developed this unique idea and concept well i did develop it out of my personal experience yes i developed everything i guess everybody develops everything that they uh you know that's that's part of their reality out of their personal experience that's who we are is uh is the sum total of our personal experience within this particular avatar that's the way we see the world so yes it was my personal experience and it was all of the above you know you went through a list of four or five different ways that this would show it was all of that and i looked at the data not only that i had things that i had experienced personally but also the data that other people had experienced and i saw that this concept of uncertainty is a very important concept in understanding psi in understanding how our reality is rendered uncertainty becomes a fundamental of a kind of a core concept the you know the the things that happen have to happen within a certain level of natural uncertainty okay that's the way it is whether it's a new thing being brought into this reality or whether it's you know the side that you're working with there has to be a certain amount of uncertainty that allows that to happen if we have certainty like we would have if it was a deterministic world if everything was certain then of course you wouldn't have you wouldn't have things like psi they would not be possible in a deterministic world which is why scientists who believe in determinism don't believe in psi as being real can't be real because it's a it's a uh, deterministic world these things that sometimes work sometimes don't they either work or they wouldn't work and they would always work exactly the same way you know every time because that's the way a deterministic world is it's very consistent and psi often is very inconsistent the way new things come into our re reality is from a random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities okay so randomness uncertainty is key here so the psi uncertainty principle is a statement of how uncertainty and psi are interconnected it's a it's a general concept i guess at at a link between uncertainty and psi so i got it several ways i got it from my experience i got it from the experience of others i saw that that um um psi effects depended on uncertainty and i also could see that the system breaks down if the cart gets too far in front of the horse too early in the game that is if people learn how to use their minds to modify future probability before they've grown up enough to apply some wisdom and caring to that skill that's a problem and that problem re, you know makes it difficult for people to grow up it is an entropy increaser not decreaser it pushes people toward deevolution not evolution so this whole um virtual reality that we have here is based on its existence is to help people grow up to lower their entropy so if you have a process that basically runs the other way increases entropy deevolves people then that would be a a system that the that or that would be a process that the system would like to inhibit if possible and i also had many personal uh experiences where certain kinds of of psi or understanding would be inhibited uh sometimes you have access to get some sort of information and you get different information and the access is denied you know, i've run into that many times and i know other people have too uh, you try to use your uh, ability to get data from the database to read uh, the numbers that are going to win the lottery 
and it's not going to work out too well for you. Unless winning the lottery is really on your way to growing up, then maybe it will work out for you because those two things would match. But if it's on your way to de-evolution, then it doesn't work out very well. So access is variable depending on whether the things that you're trying to access will raise or lower entropy. So the system does have some sense of of uh, making this environment more effective for us to learn and to grow and less effective for us to, you know, de-evolve. So just through my experience that I came to this conclusion that there was a indeed a psi uncertainty principle and it's a very general principle. It's the, it's the same principle that says you can only move the pH of water with your mind as long as there is some uncertainty in that pH. And yes, we look at the pH of water and find out that if you measure it very precisely, it kind of jumps around all over the place. It's constantly changing at the micro level. Well, that level of uncertainty then defines how much you're able to change it at any particular instant. And then you can keep building it. So that psi will only work if there is the uncertainty field with it to work within. So psi and uncertainty are an entangled pair of concepts. Yes. Uh, the next question comes from Arthur. Um, he is very interested to see uh, Tom's new organization, QSAC, that is the Center for the Unification of Science and Consciousness, uh, which is now associated with the proposed experiments in Wishes at Every mm-hmm. Success. That's QSAC.org. Wonderful how the MBT project has developed from its quite basic early days into what it is now. Some thoughts which occur when pondering the scientific investigation. Has Tom come across another VR, a virtual reality, among the many which he has experienced but rarely describes or writes much, much, or writes much about, for good reasons he's often made clear, where the residents are as inquisitive to understand the nature of their reality as we are in this one? Um, have they done similar, similar experiments to the ones Tom is proposing within the bounds of their own rule sets, of course. And if so, what were the outcomes? Did they produce a paradigm shift of the sort Tom hopes might happen here? Or are we the first to do this sort of thing? Well, most of the realities that I would call uh, tight rule set realities that are much like our reality, in in a sense that it seems physical to be there, as opposed to, say, the dream reality where the physicality is kind of uh, squishy. It's not so firm. All, in all of these realities, uh, virtual realities where the, where they are, the, the sense of it is that it's a physical reality. The people there are doing the same thing we're doing, and that is they're trying to grow up. They have choices to make, and by those choices, they evolve or de-evolve. The same, the game everywhere, no matter what re- the reality system is, has the same purpose, and that's to grow up. And yes, entities in these systems uh, are curious. Uh, some will explore inner space and understand themselves as consciousness, just as, say, uh, you know, the Buddha did uh, 2,500 years ago. You know, he was a, an explorer of inner space until he um, understood the nature of, of uh, the reality that we're in. So people in all these reality frames do that, but just like here, the ideas of the, well, I can just, maybe we'll say it this way, the, you know, these enlightened ideas, these bigger picture ideas of the nature of reality generally don't go mainstream very easily. Most people do not explore their inner space, their inner reality. Most people do not have bigger pictures. Most people are uh, motivated by their fear and their beliefs. And that's just the nature of a, um, what a lower quality of consciousness. So yes, in all of these worlds, evolution is still taking place. People are still curious. A few of them have big pictures and deep understanding. Most of them do not. Um, I don't know that any have gone through the same process we have in as much as, um, uh, they come to a point where their science tells them that 
their reality is not material, that it's probabilistic, that it's information. Uh, whether they've others have taken that same route or not, I don't. I don't know. I'd have to have lived in them a long enough time to get a sense of their history. And I'd have to go check the databases and so on and sort of like past lives. That's not all that interesting to, to uh, see that. We are where we are at, you know, now. <laughs> and we have certain uh, um, opportunities to grow up in mass now that we never had before. And I suspect the same kind of situation will take place in all those other realities as they evolve, whether it'll take place the same way that ours does. I doubt that. It'll probably all be unique to each reality system as how they grow up. But maybe it will be based on technology, finally uh, digging deep enough into their reality that they begin to see the nature of their reality from the the technical viewpoint first before it breaks into a deeper understanding at a at a uh, spiritual or uh, intuitive level but perhaps it could go the other way that the understanding at the intuitive level gains gains popularity first and they may never get to the technology that shows that this reality cannot be material but must be um, uh, informational it's hard to say either one of those could lead the process Ours is just the way ours is, and our opportunities are the way our opportunities are. So understanding the others and how they worked is not as applicable as you might think, because we don't have a lot of choices. We we have evolved to be what we are, and we have to work with that. Thank you, Tom. Another question from Robert A.C., um, Healing Negative Emotions. There are techniques like the emotional freedom freedom technique that heals negative emotions like anxiety and phobias and fear and post-traumatic stress syndrome with 90% efficiency, sometimes in hours, if not in minutes, without expecting the person to grow up spiritually. In your approach to healing, instead of visualizing the physical health of a person as a gingerbread cookie and removing its illness, have... You tried using the technique of visualizing the emotional health as a gingerbread cooking and then remove the negative emotions from it. In other words, are emotions part of your healing technique in that sense? Yes. Uh, All parts of the being, all parts of the body as well, um, can be healed with the same sort of thing. It's intent that changes probable future. So whether that's an emotional problem or a physical problem, the intent, the consciousness still is at the, you know, at at the point of change. It's still the agent of change. Intent is the agent of change, be it emotional, spiritual, you know, mental, physical, any other dimensions in which you can see our existence. They all will move. They all will change based on intent. They will all change based on getting rid of fear. So if you can get rid of fear, then you will solve a lot of these problems that are emotional. Get rid of beliefs, you'll solve a lot of these uh, ideas that are emotional. Um, You know, in this same line, there's a a, uh, Dr. Sarno and others who have come to the conclusion that most back pain and shoulder pain uh, have are psychosomatic. They have to do with stress. It's a stress problem. And that stress and tension um, is what eventually ends up causing the physical pain. And the way to fix that pain isn't by having, you know, knee surgery or back surgery or whatever. It's by changing your mind, changing your intent, letting go of the stress, and that will heal you more quickly than physical means. So there's lots of different modalities in healing, and all of them have the same fundamental root, and that is that consciousness is fundamental, and the physical is a derivative. So the key thing is in the consciousness. 
the beliefs, the fears, the stress and tension, um, those sorts of things. And that applies to emotions as well as to, uh, you know, uh, painful backs, as long as, you know, the headaches or, you know, physical problems and, and spiritual problems and emotional problems. They all will get better if the consciousness can let go of the fears and beliefs that are often at the root of those problems. And if the consciousness can be employed to modify future probability in the way these systems are, you know, like the physical system is configured. So, yeah, the mind is key in all of those. They all have the same root. So, yes, you can heal emotions and feelings as well as you can heal, you know, backs and legs and heads. Okay, the next question from Lottie is um, using intent to influence outcomes. When meditating, how do you use intent to change or manipulate outcomes? Is it possible to manipulate outcomes to meet your desires, or is that morally wrong? Is it purely a case of visualization? Do you need to reach a certain point during meditation? Do you need to use emotion or feeling? Can you expand on how you use to bring up your computer programming cards and um, how you use, I guess, meditation to bring up your pro computer programming cards? And in a more contemporary example, how could you use this today? Okay. Again, the consciousness is fundamental and the physical world is, is a derivative, is secondary. Okay, it depends on the, on the consciousness. So how do you do this? The thing that inhibits most people from being successful in either de debugging their programs, like I described in the beginning of my book, or in healing, or in going out of body, or in, you know, getting data from the databases, is their own attitudes, their own beliefs, their own sense of reality. This is the basic and fundamental problem. Once you can see a bigger picture and have a bigger picture, then the process of doing these things simplifies a whole lot. So in the beginning, when you're healing, it may take a lot of your time and a lot of your effort. You may have to go into a meditation state first and get point consciousness and then bring up um, you know, visualizations of what you're trying to heal. And if you're not a visual person, that doesn't make you uh, uh, less able to do this. You can do it with feeling. Feelings work just as well because it's not really the, vis the visualization or the feeling that's important. What's important is your mental state. What's important is your thoughts, the way you feel, your beliefs. That is important. So whether it's through a visual means or a feeling means or some other means isn't nearly as important as the way your consciousness is operating. If it's operating intellectually, you'll have very little power. You won't be able to accomplish much. In other words, if you're making wishes, I wish that person would get better, or I wish, you know, this thing would go away, then you have very small effect. You still have a little effect, but it'll be a small effect. If you can operate from the being level, then you will have a much larger effect. If you can reduce noise, that is your mind has to be focused clearly and held very steady on what you're focusing on. That's getting rid of the external noise. If you can do that, then you will be more effective. So there's just a few, three or four basic principles. Focus, clarity, low noise, being level. If you can pull all those together, then you will be very effective in whatever it is you're doing, whether it's getting data out of the database or healing or remote viewing or anything else. Mostly we're not very good at that, at putting our mind into that space. That's something that is very difficult for most of us because we have so many fears and beliefs and things that uh, get in the way. And our minds are busy. We have trouble focusing. So that takes practice to get the mind into that space where it is very 
effective. But once you can do that and do it easily, then it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. It's just there. It's just available. You see it quite, quite easily. It's like, um, you know, I, I, I teach a course. Uh, called a, an immersive. It's a, it's a get acquainted with the larger consciousness system immersive. And there I teach people to interact with the larger consciousness system directly. And we use, you know, remote viewing and healing and communicating with people who are in this physical reality and outside of this physical reality. And we use all these kind of tools just to practice getting rid of the fears and the beliefs and putting the mind at the being level, you know, functioning there intuitively rather than intellectually and we'll always find people who are beginners who have never done any of this before and therefore they have an attitude of oh we'll just go through the motions and see what happens that's their attitude they don't have any performance anxiety they don't expect to perform they don't expect to you know get right answers they're just doing it because that's what we're doing and often those people will do very well you know, out of 10 remote viewing targets, they'll get nine of them dead on, perfectly correct. And after that, it's, oh, my God, this really works. And now they start trying to do it because if they try, surely it will be better than when they weren't even trying. And then they can't do it at all. After that, they don't get any targets right because now they're trying to do it and they want to perform. And all of that now gets in the way. That's all the intellect, the ego, the beliefs, the fears suddenly come into play, whereas they let those all drop aside. So it's really an easy thing to do, but it's a hard thing to let go of the things that block it because those things that block it are part of your life. They're everyday things. They're the way you are. It's the way you process your data. It's the way you get through your life is by using your intellect to... Uh, you know, manipulate the, the world in front of you. And when you're in that mode, which is your normal alive in the world mode, it doesn't work very well if you're trying to be in the intuitive mode instead. So it's, it's not really a hard thing. And everybody has their own metaphors. People use metaphors to get there because they can't just put their mind in that space very easily. So they make up metaphors. They make up things like gingerbread cookies and, uh, you know, the, 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 the word or the lines of code that are bad are red and the other ones are, are black, you know, this sort of thing. These are all just metaphors. And they make up these metaphors to help them focus their mind on what it is they, they're trying to do. But all the metaphors come with constraints. When you use metaphors like that, then the metaphors themselves will limit you. The, the, um, you know, if you, the best way to do it is just be able to get into a relaxed, open mind at the being level and then function without metaphors. But that is extremely difficult. We need the metaphors to help us get around our beliefs and our attitudes and our intellect. So everyone comes up with their own metaphors that work best for them. That is the that would be my best advice for you. <laughs> Practice. See what metaphors work good for you. But don't be attached to your metaphors. They're just tools. And they come with limitations.